All right. Welcome everyone to the HLA virtual meeting for the HLA National Hospital Safety Program. My name is Amanda Watson and I am the HLA meeting planner. We are so excited to have you here and able to join us today. Before we begin, I would like to give you a few tech tips. If your captions don't start automatically, click the CC icon in the toolbar and choose View Subtitles. Captions can be moved by dragging the caption box. The chat box is available for technical issues. Uh, we are going to leave the chat box closed only for technical issues, but once the, key, the questions and answers are opened at the end, I will make the chat box um, available for you to chat everyone, and you will be able to answer, ask questions there as well. Um, there will be time for, to ask questions or make comments later in this presentation. Uh, when we ask for audience participation, please raise your hand and you will be called on in the order the raised hands are received. You will then be unmuted. You can find the raise hand feature under reactions. I would now like to introduce the chair of the HLA Communication Access and Healthcare Program and today's moderator, Elaine McCaffrey. Elaine, to you. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, thank you, everyone. And I welcome everyone to the HLAA National Hospital Safety Program. My name is Elaine McCaffrey and I am the chair of the HLAA Communication Access in Healthcare Program. Today's program is for positive information to be shared by the panelists and constructive ideas or questions are requested from the audience. The panelists were chosen because of their passion for advocating for people with hearing loss. These panelists get it. They understand that we live in the hearing world and we do not use sign language. The goal of today's program is twofold. First, the audience uh, will hear from individuals who have achieved excellence in providing various services for people with hearing loss. I believe that by their example, hospital personnel in the audience can take back ideas to be implemented in their own hospital. Second, I would encourage and want to encourage HLAA chapters and hearing health advocates to reach out to their local hospitals to find the right person. The right person is the person with whom you can begin a congenial conversation for the mutual benefit of the hospital and yourself as a member of the hearing loss community. Self-advocacy should begin before entering the hospital system, any medical system. By locating that right person, you can learn from that person how to make your medical records reflect that you are hard of hearing. You can learn from that person what accommodations their hospital has for people with hearing loss. And before attending any appointment in a medical se setting, call ahead and request the accommodation you know that hospital has and you need. For example, if you know the hospital provides clear masks, call ahead and request that clear masks be worn by the doctors or nurses, the people that will be participate in your appointment. In any medical setting, the biggest barrier for people with hearing loss is failure to tell your doctors or nurses, I have hearing loss, and asking for exact strategies that you need to be able to understand the speaker. For example, I say, please face me and please talk slowly. Now, the speaker often forgets. So you say, stop, please face me or please talk slowly or whatever it is that you need 
and you'll find that you will get what you need to be able to understand speech. They really do try. Thank the speaker for their efforts to communicate with you by thanking them. The education that you have just given them may be passed along to you next time you see them or to the next person they meet who has hearing loss. Amanda, would you please put up the first polling question? This addresses who is in the audience. So please uh, check, you can check more than one. Uh, doctors, nurses, and other medical personnel, hospital administrators or heads of hospitals, healthcare providers, HLA members, H hearing health advocates not connected with HLA chapters. Amanda, uh, do you say the results or uh, I think everybody can see uh, the uh, nature of the audience. So I think we're complete with this. Yep, that's it. Okay, I will move on to the important next part and that is to introduce our panelists. I have the honor of doing this. I, uh, Kevin Irvine and Carlos Ibera of Rush University Medical Center have been on the panel of the HLAA Chicago North Shore Chapters Annual Hospital Safety Pan Program now for the past three years. Kevin Irvine works at the University, Rush University Medical Center in Chicago as its Senior Talent Acquisition Consultant for Individuals with Disabilities and also serves as co-chair of the Rush ADA Task Force and facilitator of Rush Disabilities Employee Research Group. Kevin has a 30-year career in disability inclusion, advocacy, and training. Carlos Avira works at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago and has been at Rush since 2002. He has served as manager of interpretive services for over 19 years. Carlos' initiatives and excellence in interpretives as an interpreter were primary factors in Rush becoming a model interpreter program throughout the Chicago area and Midwest. He co-chairs the ADA Task Force and is a member of the Rush Diversity Leaders Council. Our second panelist today will be Kathleen Toll. Kathleen has served as systems manager at Swedish Health Hospital System in Seattle, Washington for over 14 years. Kathleen manages both interpretive services and translation and ADA communication services. Previously, she worked in social services, education, and refugee, refugee settlement services. Kathleen believes that the lessons she learned from her diverse range of experiences has helped her develop a more supportive environment for persons with sensory loss and guided her towards continuous process of improvement in the Swedish health hospital system. Our third speaker today is Sean Norris. Sean serves as coordinator of interpreting services and section 1557 and ADA coordinator, as well as the ASL interpreter at Flagler Health located in St. Augustine's, Florida. Sean, being raised by deaf parents, has close ties to the local deaf community. Sean has been working in interpretive field for over a decade, serving as an interpreter and manager of several companies and government agencies. And our final speaker today will be Dr. Katherine Palmer. Dr. Palmer is professor in the Department of Communication Science and Disorders at the University of Pittsburgh. 
and serves as a director of audiology at the University Pittsburgh Medical Center Integrated Health System. Dr. Palmer conducts research in areas of auditory learning post hearing aid fitting, the relationship between hearing, cognitive health and health outcomes and matching technology to individual needs. Dr. Palmer teaches the graduate level of amplification courses at the University of Pittsburgh, serves as editor in chief of seminars in hearing and currently serves as the past president of the American Academy of Audiology to 2020 through 2021. And now I, without further ado, uh, Kevin and Carlos, will you please uh, begin your presentation? Thank you so much, um, and uh, thank you, HLA, uh, for this invitation. Uh, my name is Carlos Olvera. Uh, I, say I am the manager of interpreter services um, at Rush University Medical Center. And um, Rush is uh, Rush University System for Health is composed of three hospitals. One uh, where Karen and I work is uh, downtown, a little bit west of downtown uh, Chicago. We have a hospital in Oak Park, uh, which is about 20 minute drive west of Chicago and Rush Copley Medical Center, which is in Aurora, Illinois, which is a little bit further down west, uh, about 45 minutes. And uh, we have a university, uh, which is within our campus here in downtown Chicago. Um, like I said, Kevin and I work um, downtown in our flagship uh, hospital and uh, we have 671 beds um, we're close to downtown near west side of chicago last year we provided about 85 different languages including asl um, and we have about 30 clinic locations throughout the city and the suburbs now those clinics are multi-specialty clinics which are i call them little hospitals um, each clinic might have, like I said, multidisciplinary, multi uh, specialty, um, you know, specialist doctors that go there. So um, we provide services to those clinics as well. Um, some of our recognitions we've um, had for three years, best place to work for disability inclusion. Uh, we scored 80% in the disability equality index. We're working on getting at 100%, uh, but it's, it's a little bit tough to, uh, to be at 100%. Uh, also, we are an honorable hospital in the US Net, uh, News and World Report. Five stars from the uh, CMS, the Centers for uh, Medicare and Medicaid uh, Services, number one for quality of services. All our hospitals are magnet, uh, magnet hospitals. And just recently, we received the Mayor's um, Medal of Honor for the City of Chicago. Uh, we're the only hospitals in the city to receive this. Uh, and this is um, from all the, that the hospital did during the pandemic and continues to do for the community in the city. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry, uh, my clicker is not moving. Okay, um, apologies. Some of our research is what we have, um, clear mask, um, and I'll, I'll go a little bit more in detail in a bit. Um, pocket talkers, pocket talkers have become very popular, um, especially during the pandemic. And I think it's because um, during the pandemic, you know, visitation um, were cut to only the patients, nobody else was allowed. Um, so this had to force our, our providers to look at for resources to communicate with our patients. And, Pocket Talkers is one uh, for our uh, hard of hearing patients. And you know, before I would have about 30 or 40 in our closet and I will last about two years. Um, and now 30, 40 might last us six months or so. So it's great that Pocket Talkers are being used. Uh, now Pocket Talkers are not uh, for everybody, as you may know. Um, but we have a team of audiologists, which is great. We have a clinic right across the street and they do um, bedside counsels if needed. Um, so that's also great to have. Um, and we have ASL and tactile interpreters that we contract agencies here in the city. Um, we have um, also have um, 
put play, uh, put things in, in our computer or scheduling systems that we use that if you're identified as needing either an interpreter um, or you know, if you're hard of hearing, there's FYIs, flags that go into our electronic medical record that we are able to see ahead of time before your, your visit uh, to know what kind of accommodations you may require. Uh, we still want to want our patients to advocate for themselves and do remind us uh, if we need. Uh, again, you know, that information needs to be entered by somebody uh, into our system. So usually it's when the patient uh, uh, either it's uh, our patient access collect that information from our patients or our patients uh, advocate for themselves. Um, closed captions in all our channels and uh, Kevin and I have been working hard to get closed captionings on our um, town halls for employees and making sure that whatever we produce uh, in our institution has closed caption um, and hearing aid batteries um, as a um, a hearing aid where I, I wear a hearing aid on my, on my right ear. Um, batteries, uh, you know, tend to run out at the worst time. <laughs> and uh, it's one of those things that you, I can never find where I have placed my extra battery. So it's nice to have um, hearing aid batteries uh, in case that we uh, run out of uh, patient needs hearing aid batteries, we can, we can provide those uh, to our patients. <clears throat> So uh, the clear mask, um, it was really difficult when uh, at the start of the pandemic um, and I and myself, um, who's kind of a, a recent um, hearing aid uh, were that uh, when the pandemic started and everybody started putting the, the, the mask on, um, it was really hard uh, for me to understand a lot of what was being said. Um, and clear mask just really opened up um, uh, that communication that they helped uh, me understand uh, with less stress, um, which is great. It took us a little time to get those clear masks here uh, to the to the to our, our, our hospital, and we initially ordered ten thousand, and we had a plan to provide them to all our uh, information desk or our, our, our frontline staff. Um, audiology had some pediatric, all the pediatric areas. Um, it was, uh, we, we uh, generated um, information for our staff and, um, it, you know, we were moving those masks and we ordered another additional uh, 10,000 masks. And at that time, uh, CDC um, came out with a new masking guidance, uh, which kind of limit the, not limit the use, I guess, it limit the use of, of, of the clear mask. Um, so instead of having the clear mask for the entire day now, uh, it was only uh, to use for the, the patient or for the staff that needs it. Um, so then uh, it's kind of a one-time use. It's still, uh, we still have quite a bit and uh, are still being distributed. So they've been pretty popular. There's some pictures of my staff um, who uh, wears them. Uh, the audiologists also wear the clear mask and um, have been really, really successful. All right. We also have on our rush.edu website, we have an accessibility resource uh, page which um, details a clear mask um, and interprets in closed captions, encouraging our patients to let the providers know that if they require a clear mask to please let them know. We also have an email that um, you can send um, any questions or requests to that email. And that email goes to me and to Kevin, and uh, we try to uh, accommodate um, that request as best as we can. Um, just, it's, uh, it's nice. Um, and I'll pass the microphone to Kevin. And it's great that we have all, all these things for our patients, but we've all, uh, Kevin has done a tremendous job to also uh, educate and, and increase that cultural awareness of, of, of uh, employees with hearing loss. Kevin. Hey, uh, hello everyone. I'm Kevin Irvine. Um, uh, my pronouns are he, him. Um, thanks Carlos for uh, all the great information. Uh, Carlos and I uh, co-chair Russia's Americans with Disabilities Act Task Force Committee together um, and have had a great partnership in the three years I've been at Rush. Um, so when I got to Rush, my role is actually kind of a unique one in that I'm on the talent acquisition team charged with recruiting people with all types of disabilities and chronic health conditions for jobs at Rush um, and working on disability inclusion, uh, both through the ADA Task Force Committee and uh, through other disability inclusion initiatives at Rush. Um, and when I got to Rush, uh, first thing I looked around is said, okay, so we're all the people with disabilities. Um, most of us 
who have disabilities uh, have invisible disabilities. So um, I've got um, multiple disabilities myself. I've got uh, HIV and also hemophilia B, the bleeding disorder. In addition, uh, my wife also has a disability that she was born with and uses a wheelchair for, for mobility. And um, our daughter has uh, multiple disabilities, including mild hearing loss. And you know, most of, uh, most of our employees who have disabilities are having visible disabilities. So one of the things that we did when we got to Rush, uh, when I got to Rush was to get uh, employees who were willing to have their photos taken and added to our careers page. Uh, we created a disabilities page specifically targeting job seekers with disabilities and chronic health conditions. And one of the reasons for doing that was, um, you know, having the photos in there makes people see that there's people with a wide range of different disabilities uh, working in a wide range of different roles at Rush. And I think it helps people feel more comfortable um, self-disclosing if they need to, um, whether or not they need an accommodation. Uh, but certainly for someone applying for jobs at Rush, we wanna make sure that they're comfortable um, self-identifying as having a disability if, if that's what they choose to do. And then uh, the other thing we started was a disabilities employee resource group. And that started about uh, two and a half years ago and it's been going really strong. Um, we've got a really great diverse group of employees from across the system uh, who attend meetings every other month. But when it comes to the work that we're talking about today, the Disabilities Employee Resource Group has been invaluable in supporting our work to make Rush more accessible and inclusive for people with all disabilities, but including hearing loss. Uh, we have a, a really uh, good core group of employee resource group members who have hearing loss and they've connected with each other, uh, both in and out of the group. Um, and some of them have actually been connected to a women's um, professional group for um, professional women with hearing loss meets pretty regularly. And when it came to uh, COVID hitting Rush um, and everyone masking up, then it was a big impact on employees with hearing loss, as Carlos mentioned. Um, and so really the, uh, the clear mask that we purchased to use at Rush, that wasn't just to serve patients and uh, visitors, it really was also to make Rush more accessible for employees with hearing loss. Um, but we also heard from some audiologists who wanted to have clear masks so that they could um, use it uh, for the when they're working with their patients. Uh, it also worked out that the clear masks were really beneficial for um, the staff working at our uh, day school, um, which uh, works with uh, young kids uh, all the way up. And when the clear mask went around Rush, that I think reinforced and, and um, really supported our work to get clear mask availability for our patients and visitors to Rush. And so I think uh, this is one thing that when we talk about uh, disability inclusion and about making your services accessible. When you've got employees with disabilities um, driving a lot of the um, a lot of the initiatives that you're doing, uh, it it makes your argument stronger for what you need to do. And I think that um, the uh, the work that we're doing to support patients and visitors with hearing loss, um, you know, makes Rush a more inclusive place for employees. And work that employees are doing makes it more inclusive for uh, patients and visitors. Um, so that's all I'm going to say for right now. Uh, I know Carlos and I are happy to take any questions you might have, um, but this is a great group. Carlos and I have participated in the local panel every year um, uh, on Elaine's invitation. And um, we really love hearing from other hospitals and health systems and hearing the questions from people that um, have experience with uh, hearing loss and going to hospitals. So thanks so much and uh, look forward to the rest of the webinar. Thank you. Next up will be uh, Kathleen Toll. Um, Kathleen, I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate being asked to be part of this group. Um, you know, 14 years ago when I came to Swedish Health Services, uh, we had four ho five hospitals and two standalone emergency rooms. And there was virtually no resources and no accommodations beyond providing um, ASL interpreters. I had the good fortune to come into contact with the Washington State Hearing Loss Association chapter. And I have to give a shout out to Karen Utter, who just was incredible, um, generous and, and sharing her knowledge and, and sharing her, her resources. And she helped us and was really, gave us a lot of feedback, um, was a pipeline to the community and helped us develop the resources that we've been able to provide over the years. Um, one of the things that became very clear is that, the, of course, the folks that didn't speak English, of course, they would be um, identified and that information would be in their charts. But the folks who had hearing loss, 
um, generally weren't as represented and that documentation didn't always occur consistently like it should. So it was very important that we create some kind of assessment tool and, and make sure that that gets to all of our staff and that they were trained to do it. Um, the folks from the Hearing Loss Association helped us provide, um, created this assessment tool and it's probably backwards on your thing, but it basically asked uh, what the sensory loss is and has um, patients be able or their visitors be able to identify that. The next thing that was really important, and I got a lot of feedback from our vendors, from community members and the Washington chapter, we had to create a system of assisted devices that would be available for all of our hospitals. And of course, you know, everybody knows how to use a pocket talker, but we also needed a pocket talker with loop. We needed um, phones that could be used in a patient room if they're gonna be admitted that they would be, they would have amplification or um, captioning as well. Um, we needed magnification devices. Um, this is the tool that we created. This is just one page of about a four page list of um, resources that we have. So that when a patient comes in, the first thing they're done that happens, if they're a new patient or a returning patient, or if they're getting scheduling over the phone, someone is going to ask them, what is their communication? need, what are their barriers, and make sure that that device or that interpreter or captioning um, or CART services is provided for them when they come. Now, the other thing that we, we learned um, from our patients was it's very irritating if you're in, you're admitted into a hospital and you're there and you've told your nurse what your, your hearing loss is and what your needs are. Um, and by the way, a lot of folks decline to bring their hearing aid to the hospital. Because as you know, many people lose their hearing aid in the hospital or during a surgical procedure. So they tend to be really cautious about providing it. Um, and so when they get to the hospital, their hearing loss is not um, as identifiable as somebody, for example, who is deaf, who would be signing. So it would be, that would be a cue to the staff that this person didn't have an ability to hear. But someone who had hearing loss um, you know, might not be, be able to be noticed. And so it was irritating to, you know, to tell your nurse, and then you would have someone come in and bring your meals and they knock on your door and you, you didn't respond. Or someone came in to clean your room or to come in and do, um, you know, some kind of uh, therapy. So they all, um, the group also worked with us chapter to create these different signs. And there we have maybe about 12 signs that identify if the patient has a hearing loss or they're deaf or they're blind or deaf blind. And it, it's just kind of a tickler for anybody going into that room to know that they have to do things a little bit different to communicate with that patient if they're going to have any um, ability to provide services. So that has been um, the things that we really depended on getting feedback um, from the community. And the Washington chapter also basically schooled me on the need for hearing loops. And that is something that we did not have anywhere within our system. Uh, we have since put a hearing loop at every registration desk and every lobby desk so that anybody who comes there can identify right away, um, point to it, and be able to have that connected to their, their hearing aid, their cochlear implant, uh, whatever device it is that they're using. Um, the other things that they were very generous with sharing with us was around the use of the hospital kit, which I understand has been something that um, the, the national chapter has had for a very long time. It was new to us. Um, they, we basically just copied everything you guys had and you know, branded it with our own hospital with their permission. And now that is available to be provided to any admitted patient when they come in. Um, the key piece of this is, you know, trying to reduce the barriers. And as we've mentioned, you know, it's one of those things that the clear mask has also been very helpful. And I think uh, Kevin and Carlos and have mentioned that, you know, it's a little bit of a challenge in a hospital setting because we have to have um, a mask that is, um, it has to be, you know, compliant with what the requirements are for infection control. 
So it does sometimes limit you to the type of mask that you can use. But again, they have been provided, as you mentioned, to all of the clinics, all of the hospital units. And, you know, although we have them, we may not know to use them unless a patient asks us or a visitor asks us. So if one of the things I'd like to get across is how important the partnership is between um, the patient, the visitors, the companions who come into our hospital or clinic locations and our, our medical system as well. We have part of the information. We may not have all of the information and we really need you to be able to tell us what your needs are. Don't be hesitant, don't be shy. Um, you know, we understand in healthcare that if you don't have effective communication, you're, that's going to come and show up on you know, your treatment plan, whether you're gonna get better, whether you're gonna keep coming back into the emergency room, whether you're gonna to have to be readmitted. We don't want that to happen and I know you don't want that to happen. So please share your information with us if it's missed or they don't give you the, the resources you need, speak up for yourself and, and ask and escalate um, and find the person who is in charge of those, those different healthcare systems. Let them know what your needs are. Let them know when a situation doesn't go well. It's been a great partnership that we've had with the Washington chapter because they've also given us feedback from their members when things didn't go well when they went into a clinic and they didn't have what they needed or something was missing that, that they should have had. That's the information we want to be able to make it better. And that, uh, you know, as we mentioned, this is always a work in progress. We never get to the point that we say a healthcare system is great. You never have to worry about it. We're always needing to do, you know, continuous process improvement. And we get that information feedback from you. Um, the other thing is, is, you know, just to know that um, we do train, but our staff and to understand about what, what the needs are. But when you have 12,000 staff and they're coming and going, moving around, sometimes you have traveler nurses, they may not always have the same level of understanding or the same level of information. So again, you know, speak up for yourself. It's the kind of thing that happens that um, sometimes people you know, they stereotype and they think, okay, this person is old, so we'll expect that they're going to have some hearing or vision loss. But there are so many folks, military, veterans, folks that have worked in factories, folks that have worked in, in loud workplace environments, you know, children, uh, teens. There are so many people that have hearing loss. And if they're not clearly identified, they're overlooked. Um, we've, you know, we do a lot of auditing in our medical files. We've seen situations where people have been, you know, possibly misdiagnosed as having dementia or delirium because they, the communication did not um, go through and the person didn't uh, react to whatever the treatment plan was. And so that, you know, that information isn't clear. That isn't effective communication. And, you know, we, we want to do the best we can do and keep doing better. Um, you know, we have a large group in Seattle. Um, we have probably, I think, I think last year we had 140,000 interpreter encounters and we served up to about 200 languages. It's a very diverse community. It's a large community with um, many deaf individuals, folks who are deaf blind, but the hard of hearing individuals are the ones that are not as easily identified. Um, for our hospital, we're starting to create a database um, from the information that's collected and documented in the medical charts. Um, it's again, there's always a lot of um, changes that happen. And we also need to know that a person, once you're assessed, you need to be reassessed. Every time you come in, your situation could have changed um, due to medical situations, sometimes a temporary due to your medication. It's something that needs to happen all the time. So, you know, that, that's, that's a, a journey that we're on. It's a journey we continue to be on. Um, I do really, you know, encourage you to connect with your local healthcare system and your clinics and let them know what your needs are. 
and that's, you know, that's the most information that, that uh, I've learned, I can say is, is one that we continue to learn, but um, you know, it's, we thank you all for everything that you do when you do share that with us. That's it. Elaine, you're muted. Thank you so much, Kathleen. I was, I really appreciate your presentation. Um, next up is Sean Norris. Sean? Hi. All right, everybody, it looks like most the captioning's working, that's good. Um, so yes, I'm Sean Norris. I am from Flagler Health Plus down in St. Augustine, Florida. Um, St. Augustine is um, one of the oldest towns in the North America, has a over a 450 year history, um, but it also is home to the Florida School for the Deaf and Blind. And we have a very, very large deaf population here, uh, which actually led to me being hired there originally just as an ASL interpreter. Um, I was an ASL interpreter and a patient liaison within the patient experience department. Uh, upon arriving, I realized how desperate the need was for disability access, equity and inclusion. None of that was provided. Um, everything was just kind of dependent on nurses maybe saying something or asking for something. Um, a lot of patients didn't feel empowered to say anything. So uh, I had to very quickly build a program. Um, and a lot of like what Rush University is doing, a lot of what Swedish Medical is doing, um, I've had, I've had to learn from, I've even spoken to Kathleen a few times uh, for tips and, su and support. Um, so really grown a program. Um, like everyone mentioned, uh, we do uh, offer signs. We have um, where we have, a, when you go into the patient's room, there's like a little sign above the bed. A lot of times uh, we love our doctors, but they don't always look at the chart and really examine who are they talking to. They just get a printout. This is who I'm going to go see. And they don't really look at it. So we want them when they go into a patient's room, they see that sign oh, this patient is hard of hearing, or this patient is deaf, or this patient speaks another language other than English. I need this and this and this to actually communicate with them. Um, we also provide our contact information before they go into the room so that way they can reach out to us so that we can provide appropriate accommodations. Um, we are working right now on updating our EMR, the electronic medical record, with the, the ability to identify each person's different communication needs. Um, again, like everyone said, for those of you who are hard of hearing or any measure of hearing loss, however you want to identify yourself, it's critical that you speak up. Um, we, we cannot just look at you and see, oh, this person has hearing loss. Um, it, it's sad to say many, there have been several cases of people going in the behavioral health unit inappropriately just because they misunderstood a question or they misheard it or misspoke on something. Um, we we want to encourage you, you know, if you feel any sense of stigma or anything about hearing loss, we encourage you don't feel that way in a hospital because we focus on everybody. We take care of everybody. Um, we're not looking to judge you based on your, your hearing ability. And we're not looking to stereotype either. We want to take care of you get you better, have you go home. We don't want to see you again. We want you to stay home. The only time that people are happy to see us is when they want to get a procedure they've always needed to get or babies. You know, everyone's really happy for those. Uh, otherwise, nobody's really happy to see us. And we want you guys to get better and get and go home. Um, Another thing that uh, we provide as well is uh, at our orientation, uh, we have new employee orientation every two weeks. Um, so, and then I personally go and I teach at each, every orientation um, for about 15 to 30 minutes about the need for working with people with hearing loss, uh, sign language interpreters, foreign language interpreters, um, access for um, people with disabilities. Um, because like Kathleen said, you have, you know, 10 to 15,000 employees. The best way to get them is when they first get hired. Uh, we also have annual competencies that everyone has to fulfill every year. So they get uh, something in their email inbox and they have to complete uh, computer-based learnings. 
um, to maintain their employment with us. Um, that's just a way we can make sure that everyone's on the same page as far as making sure people have pocket talkers, they can have um, access to interpreters um, and different things like that. Um, and another thing I would think too is um, someone mentioned the people often leave their hearing aids at home. I totally understand that. Um, when you do, when you do leave your hearing aids at home, uh, you're probably not going to get the same level of access as if you if you would have those hearing aids. So I totally understand that hesitancy to bring those things as well. Um, we also provide clear mask. We we have the clear mask. We have the communicators. So the clear mask are the ones that are completely clear around, and then the communicators have like this little uh, spot around your lips. Uh, those are really great. We use them mostly for outpatient basis because we know there's a less chance of COVID. Um, they're, they're considered level one mask. So they're, they're the same level as a fabric mask, essentially. Um, so we cannot use them with inpatients um, unless we know for a fact that they've tested negative for COVID or any other airborne uh, infectious uh, disease that they may have. Uh, once we know that's clear, then we can wear that with those patients. Um, it is a challenge for you guys during this time. I, I, I totally understand. My mother is hard of hearing and uh, she, uh, we, we call it the oral method where she would read lips often. And as she's gotten older, she's gotten more deaf and she's learned sign language to help kind of over overcome some of that too. Uh, and that's only because my, my father is profoundly deaf and uses only American sign language. So um, I don't expect anyone to do that either. But what's important is you have to be able to weigh what's going on in this hospital. How do I get access? Um, another thing I would encourage you guys is you, many of you are probably very savvy on technology uh, because of your disability. Um, things like otter.ai, that app, it's a fantastic app. Um, as healthcare systems, we cannot provide those to you guys. Um, the only reason is because they're not HIPAA compliant. Um, it goes, to, that information that's being transcribed, it's an excellent transcription, but it's going to an outside server that the hospital or the healthcare system has no control over. So if you guys want to use apps like that, we can use them, but you, you're the one who has to provide those apps. We can't provide that because then that would be us breaking HIPAA. Whereas you, you have full control over your private health inf health information. So um, just be aware that you do have options. Um, another resource that we have is the Ubi Duo. Uh, sometimes that's helpful for those who have to wear the mask the full time. Um, the Ubi Duo is like a two-sided keyboard where you can see messages in real time with each other. Um, uh, of course, also, um, we have for, for, some, for some of our hard of hearing patients that did have COVID, we wore something called a PAPR, a P-A-P-R. And it, you look like a spaceman essentially, and it's a, it's a, has a filter and everything. So you'll be able to read each other's lips using that. Um, but you have like a full, like your head's fully in constant. You have your own air filter and own air supply. Uh, so it's very, very, very cool. Uh, been very, very helpful to our uh, community. Uh, but again, we, we really depend on you guys to let us know. You guys do have that invisible disability. Um, don't be afraid to speak up. Um, and I thought it was a good point too. Someone mentioned know who to reach out to. That's that's an excellent point. Um, always a good spot to go to is asking who their um, ADA coordinator is, the Americans with Disability Act coordinator, or asking for interpreting services or patient experience. One of those departments would, would normally know who to direct you to. Uh, so I wanna encourage you guys to do that. And uh, uh, healthcare facilities, a lot of them, they don't quite know the requirements that are out there. The ADA has been around for over 30 years, but many are still not compliant and not understanding what's required of them. So um, we encourage you guys, don't be afraid to speak up. You, you have the federal government behind your back agreeing that you guys have rights to reasonable accommodations. So thank you guys for inviting me here. Sean, thank you so much. That was, that was wonderful. I appreciate it. Um, and now we're going to move along to our final speaker, uh, Dr. Katherine Palmer.
sorry, let me get off mute. Thank you very much. Um, let me share some slides. There we go. Well, this has been great to hear um, what others are doing, and I'm excited to share a little bit about what we're doing here uh, at UPMC. And this is just a slice of what we're doing. Um, and I'm happy to come back to other meetings and talk about some of the rest of it, but really specific um, to our inpatient program. So I, I kind of wanted to start with the punchline. Um, and for us, any patient who either self-identifies or is identified um, by anyone in the hospital, so that could be a nurse or a doctor, a PTOT, whoever's interacting with them, um, is having untreated hearing loss um, that is interfering with their ability to fully participate in decision-making, which is really the goal when you're in the hospital to be participating in, in what's going to happen to you and the decisions um, related to that, um, that we wanna be able to provide a non-custom amplifier to use while they're in the hospital. Um, and importantly, people take this with them when they leave. So they'll use this amplifier um, while in the hospital, while interacting, um, and then they'll take it on, whether it's home or on to maybe rehab, if that's where they're headed. Um, so that's kind of the punchline. And now I thought I would back up and talk about um, more of the specifics and the logistics of that program in case that's um, helpful to, to people on the call. So first, I want to acknowledge um, that hearing loss and hearing um, really is on a continuum. And, and I know you all realize that. Um, today, I'm focused on individuals who use hearing and speaking as their primary means of communication, as opposed to ASL. Um, we certainly um, work with a group that uses um, ASL as well, and we provide interpreters um, for the individuals who, who need that. But for today, I'm really focused on people who typically are going to use their hearing and their speech for communication, and they find themselves in the hospital um, really at a disadvantage um, to fully participate again in their care because they're not hearing well. Um, and when you think about that, that's um, the majority of people with hearing loss actually are untreated. And I'll show a little, a few statistics about that in a minute. Um, but just, you know, just to run through a lot of the things we do, and again, I won't focus on all these, but we do have ASL interpreting, um, we do use tablets running Google Live Transcribe, or if someone uses um, an iOS system like an iPhone, we use Otter, which was just uh, mentioned. And that's um, based on the patient's permission to do that because they are not HIPAA compliant, which was just mentioned. I wanted to throw out to all of you, I won't talk about it today, a new technology to watch for. It's a startup. It's called Badger by Satellite Displays. And that is an actual badge that a healthcare provider would wear and it's transcribing in real time everything that's said. And the way it's working is it's going to the person's smartphone, the healthcare provider's smartphone, that's going up to the badge. And now of course that's a little bit of, a, it's a smaller thing than having a tablet, um, but I personally think it could be very exciting to have speech to text pretty much on any healthcare provider um, you're interacting with. Uh, we also use text, which is text to speech. So that could be an individual who knows what they want to say to us, but isn't able um, to say that. Um, we work with people with cochlear implants. We do consider um, someone with a cochlear implant in our hospital. If the implant isn't working, um, that's an emergency because as you all know, uh, once the implant's not working, that person is, is deaf uh, with a small D deaf and they don't sign. Um, so we have loan equipment for that. We do hearing aid troubleshooting, we provide batteries, some of the things that have already been mentioned, and we do bedside hearing testing as well. But to focus on today, I'm really focused on the amplifier program. So these are non-custom amplifiers. And I just thought you might be interested in, in the numbers. That's what this is showing you in the hundreds, that's your y-axis in the years back to 2011, although we, we were doing this before then, but you can see a handful of amplifiers were handed out. And then um, last year we went over a thousand and we're, we're well on our way this year um, too. And this is just one of our locations. So we're, we're a very large um, health system and this is one of our larger hospitals. So I just thought I'd show you these numbers. So, so these are individuals who were provided with an amplifier during their hospital stay. And as I said, and, and took that amplifier home with them. 
So I think over a thousand feels like a good number. Um, interestingly though, if you really looked at our census and the age range of our census, this probably should be closer to 6,000 in terms of how many people probably had untreated impactful hearing loss um, when they were an inpatient. Um, but still, it's, uh, it's certainly a lot better than not having helped um, these thousand people. So the, I thought I'd kind of go through a who, what, why, where kind of scenario. Um, so who is anyone who needs hearing assistance to communicate well in our hospital? These could be people with untreated hearing loss. So they, they use nothing at this point. These could be people who've decided not to bring their hearing aids with them. And that was mentioned um, in one of the other talks. And that's not uncommon. People worry that their hearing aids um, will be lost. And my third category is people whose hearing aids were lost while they were in the hospital. And then we'll provide an amplifier uh, right away while we manage replacing those hearing aids. Another support we provide to our, our hospital system is if a hearing aid is lost while, while the patient is in the hospital, and you know, we, we try hard for that not to happen, uh, but it does, then we, um, as the audiology group supporting the hospital, provide um, a replacement at, at cost to the hospital. So the hospital obviously is paying if it's the hospital's responsibility, but we do that to support the hospital. So they can you know, kind of have a, a reasonable way to replace that and we can get moving on replacing it sooner rather than later uh, with the patient. Um, hospital personnel are obviously involved in this program. They are the ones needing to identify or the person can self-identify, which was also spoken about. And that's wonderful um, if the person self-identifies, um, but the reality in, in research, um, some of it done here at the University of Pittsburgh, is that only about 43% of older adults with impactful hearing loss ac accurately self-identify that they have hearing loss. So because it's gradual um, and it's not visual, you know, it's not obvious, a lot of people don't realize they have hearing loss and they're kind of getting by day to day. They don't realize how much effort maybe they're using. And it's really the hospital situation that makes it become evident. And that's because they're now not feeling well. They don't have lots of energy. They're probably hearing terms that are unfamiliar um, related to their condition. They're talking to people who are wearing masks, most likely, um, even before COVID. That would not be uncommon, depending on you know, where they are and what they're doing in our hospital. Um, and, and they may have um, healthcare providers who have accents that are also hard to manage. So that, that hearing loss, they felt like, they were getting by with may become a much bigger deal for them once they're hospitalized. Um, and then there are audiologists involved and audiology assistants involved in the program. So that's the who. Just to think about numbers, we know that about 60% of people over 65 have hearing loss. And that becomes a much larger number when you're over 80, it's more like 85%, but we'll go with the 60%. We know that only 18% of those individuals have hearing aids. So the majority actually of older adults anyway with hearing loss won't come to the hospital with hearing aids because they don't, they don't use hearing aids. They don't have them. So what we use is a simple non-custom amplifier. Um, we we uh, use what's called a super ear. That happens to be the device we use at this point. And we buy thousands of them as I, I showed you data from one of our hospitals, but we support over 40 hospitals. Um, so we certainly get a very good price for these because we're buying so many. Um, this is very much about improving communication in a moment in time, or maybe a few days in time. Um, we don't require a hearing test. And so that's really that philosophy that this is about communication, not about hearing. We don't need to know exactly how someone hears to help them at this moment, you know, when they have come in to the hospital and need help hearing. We um, put our, our name and address on everything um, in the hopes that when they're feeling better, they'll come to us and, and go down that pathway and get more customized care if that's what they want to do. Um, but at this moment in time, we just wanna very quickly help them communicate right, right then. Um, we use signage too. I know I, I heard someone else saying that and I, I couldn't agree more, no matter how many things you put in the e-record, um, it may or may not be seen. So we decided, um, and, and we use signs over beds and we can still do that. Um, but we kind of took a look at what the doctors and nurses seem to alert to quickly in our mind anyway. 
And that was signage on the door. And so we literally mimicked what the UPMC signs look like. They all look like this. this our sign is the same size. They're red and green. Um, we did change the wording in the red part to say, please review. So we weren't implying it was like um, precautions that, that might be more life-threatening kinds of precautions. So we, we think it's certainly a very important precaution. Um, but we decided to really think about these as communication precautions, that something bad could happen if you don't pay attention to this. And, and as a, another speaker talked about people maybe being rooted to the wrong um, treatment or place, something, you know, bad things do happen um, when there's miscommunication. Um, so we rolled these signs out using these signs about a year and a half ago, and, and um, they've been um, well received at this point. So the why of it, well, the why is, is obviously it's the right thing to do and people need to communicate. And, and I know you all know that, but in terms of actually convincing a hospital system to do it, um, it's always good if you can find something in JCO who accredits hospitals um, with language saying, this is what you need to do. And, and another speaker talked about the American with Disabilities Act clearly covers this um, as well, that people need to have access, not only physical access, but communication access. So there is, there is wording in JCO that supports um, what we do. Um, the other why that works when talking to hospitals is financial. Um, and this really impacts patients, the providers and the hospitals because people with untreated hearing loss have increased hospitalization. They have a much higher rate of adverse events and they are a third of them require readmission. And readmission, hospital administrators understand because we are not reimbursed for people who are readmitted to the hospital for the same problem they came in the first time. And in total, this is about 3.3 billion in excess total medical expenditures. So when you think of the price of a super ear, um, it is a great investment compared to this kind of thing. And the other thing has to do with patient ex um, satisfaction. And there are data that people with untreated hearing loss are less satisfied with care because they aren't always sure what's what's happening. Um, and part of our payment is now based on patient satisfaction. So there are fiscal reasons as well. Um, so in our system, we're a very branded system. We wanna make sure everybody's getting the same care. So we do roll out this program um, with the amplifiers across um, the entire health system. And for UPMC, there is no charge to the patient. Um, there's no charge to insurance, there couldn't be. Um, because this is really just a cost of doing business. This is considered part of what they need to do. Um, it is a 24 seven activity. We do take call. We consider communication an emergency, um, but we, we don't love to run in at night or on the weekends. So we, we team up with all our um, nursing stations and have amplifiers at the ready. So if we're not there, they often do still call us, but we can remind them where they are. And they can, you know, on a Sunday morning, they can get that to the patient and then we can come and check in on Monday. And then this is important in some of the hospitals where audiology isn't actually at the hospital um, in some of our more rural areas. So then we have a champion in that system and we help them and make sure they know where these are. Um, the how, um, we are, like I said, where we're attached to hospitals, audiology actually distribute the amplifiers. When we're not, we really get a champion in that hospital that we can stay connected to, to make sure the program's running. Um, using audiology assistance is absolutely essential to this program. Audiologists um, are, are way too expensive to be actually running around providing amplifiers. We think it's essential that audiology oversees this program because it has to do with hearing and communication. Um, in the past, we've tried pushing this out and just and, and having nursing stations and things take care of it. And what we find there's so much turnover um, with personnel that, that people don't always know where things are to use these. So we think it's important um, that we're on top of this and that we're managing it. And I could be wrong. You know, we, we, um, we think that's important. Oops, I'm stuck here, hold on. Okay. Um, why would an audiology support group support this program? I think this is a question maybe that gets asked if, if you've approached audiology groups maybe. Um, one thing when I talk to my audiology colleagues is if you're part of a hospital system and don't actually do things on the inpatient side, you are invisible as a profession. You, you really aren't thought of, you don't get resources. So our visibility on the inpatient side is very um, positive for us as a group. 
Uh, we do label everything, as I said, so we end up with new patients because of these interactions, not only just the person who was an inpatient, but it could be their family members um, who feel connected having seen that. Um, and it's important to get paid for your services, and that's certainly possible. So you create a contract with the hospital, um, so you're paid directly, obviously, for doing this. But again, you have assistance providing the care if you um, have students being trained, Students are great ones to be doing this. It's a great experience for the students. And volunteers absolutely could be deployed by this if they were supervised by audiology. You could 100% use volunteers. Um, challenges. Um, most of the people with untreated hearing loss are still missed, honestly, uh, because this is all about self-report. We know that only about 50% of healthcare providers accurately um, identify when someone has a hearing loss. Um, so that's still a problem with the, the model. Um, there is a constant need for education. Someone talked about when people are onboarded and we have what's called ULEARN, so ongoing compliance education. You have to kind of embed it everywhere so people are still thinking about this. Um, the new rechargeable hearing aids, which are awesome, often get worn into the hospital and the charger is not brought with them. So they're awesome right until the, the charge runs out. Um, but then we can provide an amplifier and, and have a family member maybe take that hearing aid home if they don't want to bring the charger in. And then lost hearing aids uh, continue to be a problem. This in, the, in a framework, just to give you a framework for this, we call this interventional audiology. We think it's a really important part of audiology um, where we're trying to um, treat hearing loss when it's not the primary concern for the patient or the provider, but that it's gonna negatively um, impact healthcare outcomes. And these are just, in, you do not need to read all this, but the first thing of each of these bullets show you that we name all our programs. And I know that probably sounds silly, but we found that's really important actually in the system to call it something and then everyone can refer to it. And they'll say, oh, the You Hear Initiative or the I Hear Initiative. Um, so we work with home health, we work with all sorts of other people in the same kind of interventional audiology. But the last piece I just wanna mention is our very newest program in perioperative um, care. So perioperative is like prehab, people come in, for an evaluation before they go to surgery. We now screen everybody. We do a hearing screening on everyone. We provide them with an amplifier. So when they talk to everybody that day, they can um, know what they're being told to do uh, to hopefully Im improve that. Um, and then what's become the most exciting part of this is there's a, a color-coded sticker that says whether they need one of these amplifiers, amplifiers or not. That follows them actually to surgery, which could be a couple of weeks later. Then the nurse in pre-op knows to get them an amplifier. They keep the amplifier right into the OR and then still on them into pre-op. And in our reports back from patients and especially from the nurses is this has been wildly successful to have patients be just more in tune, more attached when they're being given directions. And for some of our patients with hearing loss, they've just told us that that it's terrifying to go into surgery knowing they're going to take your hearing aids away from you and they're still going to be telling you things and you're not sure what's happening. So we felt really good about this program and it's been awesome to team up with anesthesiology who actually runs uh, the perioperative clinic. Okay, let me stop sharing there. And just um, I, again, to summarize, it, it's not that everybody just needs a simple amplifier, but I will say a lot of people that is all they need in terms of just communicating in that moment in time, a simple amplifier can make a huge difference on just not using all that effort, You know, being able to take in what's being said, being able to participate in decisions that are being made. And this is for our palliative care and our hospice care. Um, as well. It's a big part of just making sure people can hear without being yelled at and everybody can kind of stay, stay calm and, and make decisions that need to be made um, in that setting. So Elaine, let me stop there and hand it back to you. Catherine, Dr. Palmer, thank you so much. I, I, I want to thank all the panelists. I had not heard their presentations. I merely understood in talking to each one that they were passionate advocates for people with hearing loss. And um, this is such a wealth of information. I'm gonna go back and watch the recording for sure on the HLAA website. And I want to let everyone know that you, it's for free to go on www 
hearingloss.org and look for the webinar. I imagine it will be posted within a week or so. It's captioned and you can share this with other members of your hospital or other chapter members, because there is more information than I could absorb. I mean, I they hit all the notes um, and I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. And, and now, Amanda, would you please do the uh, second and last uh, polling question, please? How will the, how would you be, would you be interested in furthering the conversation between hospital representatives and the hearing loss community? Yes or no? If you are interested in furthering the conversation between the hospital representatives and the hearing loss community, who are you? And you can take multiple choices. And Amanda, you can end the poll when you see fit. Still seeing a little bit of movement, so I'll All right, I'm going to unpull and show you the results. There you go. So it looks like yes, people want to further the conversation. And, um, from all different um, parts of the community. I'll stop sharing. All right, Elaine. Thank you, Amanda. Um, and I think that uh, we have moved on to the time for uh, questions from the audience. And Amanda will uh, uh, be giving you the, again, reminding you of how to go about this and to uh, put your, raise your hand and also uh, put, you can put questions in chat, I understand. Yes, thank you, Elaine, and thank you to all our presenters. It's been great so far. Um, I have now made it available. You can now chat with everyone, um, and you can put some questions in the chat box, or in the, I'm sorry, yeah, in the chat box. Um, I'm trying to save questions we get in the chat box so that the presenters and Elaine can uh, uh, maybe answer later. But for now, um, if you have a question, please raise your hand, uh, your virtual hand, please, not your actual hand. Um, you can find the raise hand feature under reactions on the, the bottom bar in Zoom. And so I will, um, I will be calling your name and unmuting you. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll request to unmute you. On your screen, you will see um, a pop-up that has you unmute yourself. And then you can ask your question. Um, and then the, the panelists will answer it for you. So first we have Richard. Um, I'm gonna ask to unmute you, Richard. Okay, thank you. The presentation was absolutely exceptional. I received a lot of great information. In Sarasota, we've worked for decades to get Sarasota Memorial Hospital to be involved with those with hearing loss, unsuccessfully. And uh, last year, I, I worked with Sertoma, and we donated 10 portable hearing loops to the hospital. And it was a fight to get them to accept them. And now I'm sure most of them are sitting in, in a closet someplace. So my only statement is you see my name on the screen. My email is at gmail.com. I could use some input from hospital administrators the approach that I need to get them to accept more hearing loops. In fact, they're building a new hospital in Venice, Florida. We have a huge grant available through HLAA and they won't even talk to us. So I could use some input from, from anybody who is willing to help me. So it's richardparker at gmail.com. Um, that's all the time I'll take in a second. Thanks for your comments, Richard. Um, next up, we have Ann Thomas, and I'm going to ask to unmute you. All right, Ann. Thanks. Listen, I was I liked the presentation as well. I was really 
um, hoping that I would see the international symbol for hearing access on your um, websites and on the information that was presented today. I think it's really important that you recognize that it could be very helpful for people who don't self-identify with hearing loss. Who That doesn't happen to me, me. I'm raising my hand asking for the accommodations I need. But all of us here know that there are many people who are not doing that. And if you posted that sign all over your website, in your clinics, in your facilities, some people might go, oh, that ear with a slash in it, maybe there's something here for me. Thank you, Anne, for your comments. Um, next up, we have Margie Pomerantz. Margie, I'm going to ask to unmute you. Thank you for an excellent presentation. I'm wondering if we decide to contact the hospitals around us to find out what they have available, what department, who would you suggest we ask for when we get the hospital operator? Uh, how do we get in? What suggestions do you have on that? Sean, why don't you repeat what you said and anyone else can jump in? Sure. Um, I, I would ask for the ADA coordinator, the Americans with Disabilities Act coordinator. They might be known as other things. They might be known as the Section 504 coordinator, which refers to the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, I want to say. And then there's another Section 1557 coordinator, and that's from the Americans, uh, the Affordable Care Act, excuse me. Um, from uh, a few years ago, well, about almost 10 years ago now. Um, those are your best bets because those are the ones that cover language access or a communication access. And if not, you can ask for patient experience. Um, you could ask, you, you could always ask for risk management. They will definitely know who to, who to contact because they do not like to get lawsuits and they will guide you the, the right way. So those are the, the ones I would recommend. And how about interpretive services? Th those two, <laughs> they should know. And sometimes they're, I think in our hospital, it's actually called disability resources. But I, I do think leading with that ADA, that'll catch their attention and they'll figure out where to, to send you. Sometimes it's also under compliance or accreditation. Mm -hmm. You never know where it's going to land in hospitals. Great. Thank you all. Um, next up, the question from Jerry Tierney. Jerry, I'm going to ask on mute you. Oh, hi, Jerry. Thank okay. Um, good morning. I, I found something that, that I came across in my reading somewhere that seemed like a really good idea that ask people that are hard of hearing to identify every single time they ask for your name and birthday, which would be everybody across, I'm a nurse, and it's a lot of people across the healthcare field, they have to ask your name and your birthday multiple times. And if it's just name, birthday, I'm hard of hearing. If it's just that, that third piece on there, I would think that, um, that would at least be a start. Thank you. I just want to make a comment with that. I think that's a great idea. Something we have not been successful at, but I think goes along with what you said, that when they ask you your name and birth date, what they're doing is they're checking your wristband to make sure it matches what your answer. And we have wristbands for other things like a risk of fall risk. So if we have a patient who's a fall risk, and I've always wanted to have a communication risk wristband because the, you know they they hospital personnel are very good at checking wristbands because those tend to be the alerts that they need to know but I have not been successful with that just to be honest but I do think it would I think it would be a good idea I would like to add um, this is Sean from Flagler again um, I would like to add we have successfully gotten the wristband for communication access at our, our healthcare facility um, of course it had to an event had to happen for that to take place. So a compliance review was, was formed. Um, so we agreed having wristbands 
Um, so it's just a blue wristband. It's, so it's brightly colored, it's noticeable. And then we also write what communication access. So maybe if the patient speaks Spanish, it'll say Spanish. If the patient's hard of hearing, it'll say they're hard of hearing. It's just a really simple wristband that we use. Um, it, it requires more legwork on our team to make sure everyone has those wristbands throughout the healthcare facility, but we found it to really reduce the, the friction that can occur between, you know, a transporter just coming in and taking a patient out of the room. They're supposed to check the wristbands before they leave the room. So they see that, oh, this patient has a communication need. Let me make sure I have the appropriate resources for that. That's awesome. Is it, and their self, for the people with hearing loss, it's still self-identified. Either they're identifying or someone in the system identifies. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. That's awesome, Sean. Thank you. Um, and for those asking questions in the chat, we're not gonna be asking those questions live right now. Those will be um, to ask uh, the presenters later. So if you really wanna ask a question now, um, I would raise your hand. Um, next up, we have Philip Kuttner. Kuttner, um, I'll ask on you, Philip. There you go. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, first of all, I wanna thank you for a very wonderful program. Uh, my question deals with a problem I have in hosting Zoom programs, and that is this closed captioning. Uh, I've had people suggest go to YouTube to learn how to use it, et cetera. Uh, do you have any suggestions on closed captioning in reference to Zoom, Zooming? hosting Zoom groups. Are you having trouble turning it on? No, or? no, having other people uh, to use it uh, who need it and uh, uh, they resist it. And then uh, oh. this is the problem. They resist using it even though they could. So, I mean, yes. they need an updated version of Zoom. That is one thing. People do need to get the more recent version. So some people think they don't have it, and then they just have to be reminded to download the recent version. And if they're refusing to turn it on, I have no words <laughs> that would <laughs> to say. <laughs> Maybe one of the other panelists do. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know what to say to that. I mean, assuming you're, usually if you're hosting a Zoom meeting, you want people to know what you said. <laughs> so you'd think you'd have every means for that. I don't know what well. to say. And if it's a medical provider that you're talking about, yeah, you know, I'm sure you do, you talk to them before and when you set it up, but reminding them that it's required for them to provide effective communication to you and that they really need to do that because it's part of the requirements of the ADA and Title VI and Section 508. Um, and, you know, letting the scheduler know that, letting the provider know that. Um, and if they don't, you know, you've given that information and you've asked for the accommodation. Um, you're going to want to move it up, escalate it, um, escalate it to the to the hospital, to the clinic. And if you have to, you know, unfortunately, um, to Department of Justice, you know, to the whatever means you have, because, you know, it it isn't it isn't just a means of being polite. You cannot effectively communicate and interact, and it could be a patient safety issue. So, yeah. All right, thank you so much. Um, next up is Kathy Coco. Kathy, I'm gonna ask on mute you. Hello. Um, so, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. So um, one of the things is I don't have a problem speaking up and um, the majority of my services um, or my, my medical care is through one system, which includes a hospital. And I just wondered, um, you know, when I go to one of those visits, is there somewhere in your record, like they have a place for allergies where they would note the hearing loss It, it depends on the e-record that's being used and how they've tailored it, to be honest. So I don't think any of us can answer that as a blanket statement. Okay. 
it can be set up that way. Um, okay. So check with the specifics medical system. Because the other thing is I had an experience where I was unconscious and I'm deaf in my right ear and I don't know how long they were speaking to me, you know, and um, I know they had looked at my records. I, I don't believe it was in there, but it would have been nice. Yeah, it's, it's well worth asking that and, and encouraging okay. them. And then there was something in the chat about medical alert bracelets. Yes, and I would just say oh. medical people definitely look at emergency um, alert bracelets. And that is something to consider if it, you know, like you just said, if you're not in a situation to be able to tell them the situation, then it would at least you'd be wearing that and they would look at that. Okay, great. Thank you. And also, I'm really enjoying the presentation from each one of you. Just just a quick um, extra is that, you know, if most hospital organizations are using an electronic uh, medical record like Epic, most of them have the functionality to do to do that. But it depends on the individual um, system. What do they want to open up and utilize and how they want to do it? Um, and I can just tell you my struggle has been with our, our IT people is adding anything, you know, getting them to capture additional information is just a huge deal because you can't make one small change that doesn't impact a, a, a enormous amount of people across the system. So, you know, we, we capture um, sensory loss, uh, you know, if there's, we also capture the type of assisted device that they may be needing. Um, you know, that all information should be on the top bar or somewhere um, along where the record is so they can see that. And if not, I would encourage your system, you know, to do that. All right, thank you all. Um, next up is Peggy Ellerston. Peggy, I'm gonna ask to unmute you. All right, Peggy. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Great. Um, I want to thank Elaine McCaffrey for pulling off an amazing presentation. It was just spectacular. And uh, just the diversity of the speakers and the um, that gives me hope that there's so much wonderful work being done. I especially appreciate your positivity and the reminder that hospitals are complicated places and we have to be civil but also persistent. So uh, thank you so much. I just like to give a heads up to uh, all of you about the column that this program is coordinating in Hearing Life Magazine because a number of topics that we've touched on today um, have been addressed and will be addressed in the future. So just uh, to give you a, a sort of thumbnail sketch, in the summer issue that just passed, um, there's a very important article from Megan Morris, one of our research advisors on electronic health records. Um, it's on the HLAA website, so you can access it um, pretty easily. I'd also, I'm very happy to, uh, share with you that Dr. Palmer will be writing for the winter uh, 22 issue. And we're hoping that um, there will be at least one column on ADA coordinators. Um, I can't disclose who's writing it because we haven't reached an agreement yet, but it looks like that's going to happen as well. Um, you can also ask your providers to subscribe to the stakeholders list so that your providers can receive these columns in a PDF file from HLAA's national office. The more we push this issue out, the better education uh, we all, including the healthcare providers and administrators, will get about the enormous complexity of, um, of this issue. So thank you again, Elaine, and that's all from me. And thank you, Peggy, for all your work uh, for these articles in Hearing Life. Uh, as Peggy mentioned, that is on the HLAA website for free. Uh, and you can look at the array of Hearing Life magazines and uh, follow the column. Thank you, Peggy. 
Thank you, Peggy. Um, next up is Tony Farrakh. Tony, I'm going to ask on mute you. Hi. Uh, the first question I have, I got a question for Catherine, but then first I wanted to ask um, the Rush Hospital presenters. Um, it was mentioned that the patients can ask for the accommodation before entering the hospital. Do those patients also see a list of the equipment available when they are requesting access? And also, will all the providers that come into that room be following those or is the patient gonna have to be his own advocate again uh, once he's in the, in the hospital room? And then this question I had for Catherine, as you mentioned about the, um, uh, the equipment, if, if, uh, if a hearing aid is lost in the hospital, you give a replacement. Uh, is that typical for all hospitals? That's all I have. Okay, Kathleen, you want to take the first yeah. part? Yeah. So for um, folks that are, if they're setting up their schedule over the phone, they can be referred to our, um, our website, which has the menu on it, as well as the uh, communication assessment tool. If they show up in site, every single registration um, person, every cubicle, every location has these tools with them. And they're, you know, they're unlaminated so they can be wiped down for infection control. So they're shown that if they're not able to see, then they're able to, to you know, read it out to them out loud. Um, we, we encourage people to do that ahead of time. So it could be there and waiting and ready for them when they show up. But if they do show up without this communication or this conversation, um, they'll be asked when they show up and then it could be brought to them. Um, they'll call our MSC, our central line, um, group, who will come and deliver it to them. And so in terms of the lost hearing aids, no, I, I don't think that's common, um, a, a program. You know, it's part of, again, it being an integrated healthcare system, the idea is we, we're all trying to support each other because we're one group. So it doesn't help us if the hospital loses a hearing aid to have to pay um, an exorbitant amount of money. So that's that's why we do that, replacing a cost. And of course, the patient then can go back to their own audiologist. They don't have to work with us. That's their choice. But we can at least get them the correct device um, to have that replaced. The other thing we're doing now is anyone in the Pittsburgh area can um, call us with a serial number if a hearing aid's found, like in like laundry services and things like that. And then we can track down who actually belongs to the hearing aid or who the hearing aid belongs to, to try to get it back to them. I mean, it's for, this is Carlos from Rush. Um, we do not have a set list of, of um, accommodations that we we certain uh, that we have. And uh, so it's pretty much uh, a patient will ask for an accommodation. And Kevin and I will um, shoot up emails to different departments to see if we can accommodate. Um, and we try the best that we can to accommodate uh, that request. Um, so there's no like static list that we have that we only uh, provide this type of accommodations or hearing aids or um, batteries. So we, you know, it's always great to know ahead of time. Um, and that's why it's great for patients, you know, when they advocate and uh, we might already have um, the device that that patient is uh, requesting. Uh, and it's great to know ahead of time um, we do uh, have FYIs that can be uh, placed on our uh, electronic medical record on the very top of the um, for the patient's electronic medical record. Uh, so all providers will see that um, FYI, which is kind of, um, it's a free text. So either myself, um, or Kevin can enter it um, into that uh, patient electronic medical record. Um, just to let you guys know that captioning is gone. So some of our uh, deaf sign language users are asking me to interpret. Oh, yes, I do see the caption. The captioner has, I think something has happened to the captioner for, hold on. Give me one second. Well, I mean, uh, hold on. Let me just do ASR. Um, I apologize for that. I've never seen the captions end before. Um, we are near close, Amanda. Yes, let me just close it out. We are uh, one more minute. 
left. Um, I want to thank Elaine, especially for putting this whole program together. Um, great presentations. Thank you all to all our presenters. It was really wonderful. Um, this has been recorded and will be posted to the HLA website. Um, you can go to hearingloss.org to view the recording. And at, please uh, let us know if you have any more questions for the next minute in the chat. I will save the questions and post um, the answers with the, re uh, the recording on the HLA website. Um, thank you all for being here and I hope you have a great rest of your holiday. Thank you everyone. And thank you to all the panelists. I, I cannot tell you uh, what a wonderful job. I appreciate so much you being here today. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Elaine. Thanks for organizing this.